And so in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, let's invite the Holy Spirit first before we pray to, uh, to anoint our hearts to receive from Him. Father, we come to You in Jesus' name, and we ask that Your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into the truth, that He would circumcise our hearts, that we would have an open heart and mind to hear what the Spirit is saying, to see what the Spirit would show us and give us a circumcised heart to obey your word. Lord, we don't want to be just hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. And Lord, we ask that you would forgive us when we fall short and help us to run the race with endurance, to get back up when we fall and to pursue you with everything within us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let's, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them with respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For indeed, for a few days, chase, chastening, chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. May God's word bless us as we obey it. Hallelujah. Title of my sermon today is The Race of Faith. The Race of Faith. And, and, I, and I took some time to look up that word race in the Greek. And that word could also be translated battle, as in like fighting, a battle, the race of faith. Now, for those of you who've ever done long distance running of any kind, and when I was younger, I used to do that. I, I don't do that now. Um, but when I was a, a young man, I used, to, I used to run on an average five miles a day. And, and it was a race because I would always time myself and I'd always want my time to be better and better and better. And I know that during the course of a race, it seemed like a battle. You battle fatigue. You, fat, you battle boredom. You battle discouragement. You battle whatever. Maybe cars, if you're running on the street or, or, or others that might be running alongside of you. But it can be a battle. And we are called to run the race. And I remind you of Paul's words where he says that he, has, he ran the race. He had run the race, and he was ready for God to redeem him. He knew that his time was up, and, and, and he told his, his fellow believers and his, his son in the faith, Timothy, that he had run the race, that he was ready to meet God. And every single one of us here, no matter how young or how old we are, we are called to run the race of faith. And so the title of my sermon is The Race of Faith. My thesis is this. Let us look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let me say that again. Let us look 
to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And for my YouTube friends, I would like to exhort you to look to Jesus. Maybe there are some of you out there who don't know Jesus personally. And I'm here to tell you that you need to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of anyone's faith. Jesus made it very clear that we are sinners, that we all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. He has made it clear to us through his word that the wages of sin is eternal death, separation from God, burning in, in the lake of fire forever and ever. But that is not God's plan for you because he also made it very clear that he did not create hell or Gehenna for men, but he created it for the fallen angels and for Satan. God doesn't want anyone to perish. And that's what Jesus said in John 3, 16. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And what does he mean by believing? Is it an intellectual belief? No, it's not an intellectual belief. It's a belief where you put your entire life into his hands. Where you come to him and admit that you are a sinner, that you need him to save you, that you ask him to come into your heart, and that you ask to be born again of God's spirit. Because unless a man is born of the spirit and water, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the water is a representation of the word of God. The living word is the water that washes us clean. It's also the, the vehicle, the, the tool that gives us faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I'm giving you God's word so that you can have faith in Jesus Christ, that you can be born again. Amen. And I want you to know something. God saved me a long time. I've been a born-again Christian since 1974. And I give God all the glory and praise for it. And, and my life has been full. God has blessed me. And it's been an adventure. Let me tell you something. Being a Christian is not boring, especially if you walk in faith. Because if we walk in faith, we're going to be running a race. We're going to be engaged in battles. We're going to have a very interesting life. And I just encourage you that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the most important thing you can do right now is, is to bend the knee of your heart and to ask Christ into your life. For those of you who have already done that, we want to talk about this race that, we have that we've already joined however many years ago. And the first thing that we need to understand that it's a race of faith. The just shall live by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. The hope, uh, actually I misquoted that. Let me go back to that. I don't want to misquote that. It's so important. He, in Hebrews 11, 1 it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I knew I had that backwards. Every once in a while the dyslexia kicks in. But um, God is good anyways, right? The Holy Spirit gave me the check. He said, go, go read that verse. But, but that's faith. That's faith. I have not seen Jesus with my own physical eyes. But I know that he lives. Amen. I know that he's coming back. I know that he has saved me. I echo the Apostle Paul's words where he says, I know whom I have believed. And I know that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. What did Paul commit to Jesus? His entire life. Everything about him. And what, was he con uh, what, what, what did he know about that? that? That God would preserve him until the time of the rapture when Jesus would give him his glorified body. And the Apostle Paul has since died and gone on to be with the Lord because to be absent from the body as a Christian is to be present with the Lord. And Paul, with all the other Christians who have passed on, are in heaven yearning for the rapture. Yearning for God to, to clothe them with their glorified bodies, just like we who are alive are yearning for the rapture. That's what I'm yearning for. I want Jesus to come back to the planet Earth. I want to see him face to face. I want to watch him establish the throne of David. I want to see him do all the things that he promised he would do in his word. But I have faith. I haven't seen these things yet. And I, but yet I'm hoping for them. And so we need to run the race of faith. Secondly, we need to see our discipline in the faith. And thirdly, we need to see our training through faith. So let me say that again. Our race of faith, our discipline in the faith, 
our training through faith. Our race of faith, where does it begin? Well, in verse 1 it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let's stop there for a second. What is it talking about witnesses? We're surrounded by witnesses? Yes. In the heavenlies, right now, there are believers, Old Testament believers, New Testament believers, who are watching us run this race. But it's not just believers, it's also angels. Because in Ephesians chapter 3, we are told that the angels are looking at the church through its holy apostles and prophets to see the will of God played out through the ages. As believers, we have a purpose. Our lives should be driven by the purpose of running the race of Jesus Christ, following in his footsteps. And that is a high call. Because Jesus did a lot of things. He did miracles, you know. We can do miracles too. I believe that. I believe that as the Holy Spirit gives us faith, we can see miracles done in our own lives. I believe that as believers in Jesus Christ, we can lay our hands upon the sick and the sick will recover. I believe that we can see people delivered from demonic possession, from addictions, from physical problems. And it's happened in this church. On many times, the people that we have prayed for in this church have been heal healed of physical, you know, physical problems. One lady was dying of cancer. And they told her she was going to die. She lived for two more years. It wasn't her time. Another woman was going to have a double mastectomy. Right? I got that right. And they didn't have to do it. That same woman had a heart attack. And we prayed that her heart would be completely healed. And it was. There was a, 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 a community supper many years ago where it was our, our uh, harvest supper, where we have the turkey and the, and the, the provisions, the, the stuffing and the gravy. And God fed 250 people with, I believe it's 12 turkeys. That's impossible in the natural. Because I've been told that a good-sized turkey can feed about eight to nine people. Do the math. It doesn't add up in the realm of God. And to, to make things even crazier, the man who was dishing out the turkey, Eddie Martinez, and Eddie, if you're watching us on YouTube, hello, from the great white north. Um, Eddie didn't, doesn't know the concept of small portions. And he was plopping big portions of turkey on everyone's plate, and every person was fed, and all the food ran out all at the same time. The mashed potatoes, the gravy, the stuffing, the squash, all at the same time. It's a miracle from God. Amen. And I bet there's probably hundreds of miracles that have occurred in our presence that we're not even aware of. How many times has God protected our lives in the supernatural? Because we have guardian angels, you know, that, that, that guard us against death and other problems. But we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And it says here, what should that cause us to do? It says, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily ensnares us. And I believe that those weights and snares may differ from person to person. And God is calling you to lay aside that snare. To lay aside that weight, that sin. To do what? So that we can do the next part. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. God has a race and a purpose for your life. And I don't know specifically what that is. Sometimes God gives people words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and they can speak into a, a person's life exactly what, they, you know, what that race is. But a lot of times, most of the time, it's between you and God to figure out what that race is. And in order to know how to race, you got to practice to race. My son is on the cross-country team at Valley Forge Christian College. And they have to practice running races so that they know how to run the race. 
how to approach a hill, how to you know, get the breathing, also to train their bodies to be able to deal with the stress of running the race. And like I said, this word race can be translated battle. And I do believe that we are in a battle, a spiritual battle, not with flesh and blood, but with principalities of, and powers of wickedness in high places. And when do you train for a battle? Do you train in the middle of a battle? No, you train before the battles begin. If you're at peace right now, you should be training your spiritual hand for war. And how do you do that? By studying God's word, because it's the sword of the spirit. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we have the Bible studies that we have in this church. Because we want you to know how to wield this sword like an expert swordsman. See, because there's a lot of Christians out there that try to use this weapon. And because they're not used to using it, they do more damage than good. Hence the, the concept, a little knowledge is dangerous. You know, I, I had one lady come into, into my store when I used to work at, at, at a Christian bookstore, and uh, she was emphatic. She goes, you know, those people who believe in the rapture, they're teaching a false doctrine. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say the word rapture. She was going on and on. My pastor said, there's no rapture. And, of course, I'm there to sell books, not debate theology as much as I wanted to. I had to bite my tongue. But that poor woman was suffering under only a small bit of knowledge. In the English Bible, she's right. You search the English Bible, there's no word rapture in the English Bible. That word rapture came from the, the Latin word rapturo. And that Latin word rapturo came from the Greek word harpazo. And the harpazo is in the Greek in the New Testament. It's found in several places, uh, very prominently in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And basically what the harpazo is, is God snatching you up violently and taking you home. And Paul was teaching the early Christians. In fact, 1 Thessalonians, according to most conservative scholars, is the oldest New Testament book. It was the first New Testament book written. And so Paul was teaching the early Christians that no, you're not going to go through the tribulation. Jesus is going to snatch you up first. He's going to harpazo you. Now that poor woman is suffering under a small bit of knowledge. I can give you another example of something similar. If you look in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it ever use the word Trinity. But yet the Bible clearly teaches that there is a Trinity. That there is a Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there are passages where all three of the, of the persons of the Godhead are in action. Most, one of the most notable ones is the baptism of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was being baptized in water, when he came up out of the water, the Father said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased from heaven. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him, and the Son of God was the one who came out of the water. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the concept of the rapture is all throughout the scripture. Enoch, in Genesis chapter 5, is an Old Testament example of the harpazo. Because in, in Genesis chapter 5, it says Enoch walked with God, and then Enoch was not because God took him. That's all the harpazo is, is God taking us to be with him. We need to be in God's word daily. I just gave you a big example. There are, are examples within our lives. I believe a lot of Christians don't know what they should be doing because they're not spending the time that they need to be in God's Word. And Micah 6.8 reveals that to us. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Even if you just start right there. That's very basic. That's theology 101. If you do that, you will be doing the will of God. And as you run that race, as you do justly and love mercy and walk humbly before your God, God will take you into deeper and deeper understanding of his word. And he will bless you with blessings upon blessings. In fact, we are the stewards of God's word. And as God's stewards, we bring out old treasures and new. 
What is, what is he talking about there? He's talking about how the old treasures we found in the scriptures help shine light on the new treasures which we are now discovering within the scriptures as well. My example is I've never done a, a series in the book of Hebrews before. And I've been finding all kinds of new treasures that, that, that have light shed upon them through the old treasures of the other passages that I have preached series out of. It's, it's been awesome. I'm kind of sad that the book is coming to an end. We only got a couple more chapters left. <laughs> Chapter and a half. But we are to run this race with endurance. Why? How do we do that? By looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I looked up that word endurance. And it comes from the Greek word hypomone. And it means, in the New Testament, the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety, even by the greatest trial and suffering. God bless you. Let me read that again. In the New Testament, this is the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. We have a lot of believers that have gone ahead of us who did this very thing, who endured fiery trials, great trials, great sufferings, the pilgrims, the, 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 our forefathers endured great suffering and trials so that they could come to this nation, so that they could be free to worship God. Not free from the worship of God, but free to worship God. And there's a big difference between the two. I also uh, took the time to look up the word author here, and it comes from the Greek word archaeos, and it means one that takes the lead in anything and thus affords an example, a predecessor in a matter, a pioneer. Jesus ran this race before us. He's the first one to run this race the way it's supposed to be run. He is the first fruit of the first resurrection. And he ran this race as a pioneer. Jesus is our trailblazer. He showed us how to run this race. And his ministry began when he was in the desert. The Holy Spirit led him to the desert. And the Holy Spirit might lead us to some kind of desert. And in the desert, the Holy Spirit led him to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he was tempted by the devil. And the way he fought off the devil's temptations is every time the devil tempted him, he said, in the word it is written. It is written. It is written. Even Satan tries to use the Bible against Jesus and Jesus corrects his incorrect use. He puts it in context. It is written. And we know that the Jewish people studied the scriptures. We know that they were the people of the word. Muhammad calls them that, the people of the word, later on. You know, don't, you know those people of the word. What is he talking about? The word of God. Amen. The word of God. And Jesus is the one who took the lead. He gave us the example. He's our predecessor. He's our pioneer, but not only that, he's our finisher of faith. And I looked up the word finisher. It comes from the Greek word teletos, and it means a perfecter, one who has in, an own, in his own person raised faith to its perfection. We are perfected by Jesus. Our salvation begins with Jesus. In 1974, I heard Jesus say to me, Nelson, I stand at the door and knock. If you open that door of your heart, I will come into you and I will sup with you and you with me. And ever since then, Jesus and I have been having dinner together. 
I'm not talking about a physical dinner. I'm talking about a spiritual dinner. And it involves his word. It involves prayer. It involves worship. It involves endurance. It involves obedience. It involves rebuke. God has rebuked me. Because I am not a perfect person in my flesh. In my flesh, like Paul, dwells no good thing. That's what Paul said. And I confess, same thing with my flesh. In my spirit, I've been perfected. See, the process of God's perfection begins with our spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, And may the God of peace sanctify you, spirit. They sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, and body. My spirit has already been perfected. My soul is in the process of being perfected. What is my soul? It's my will, my intellect, my emotions. And that's where the battle is in the mind. Am I going to obey God and do God's will today? Or am I going to do my own will and disobey God? That is the choice before every Christian every day. And we need to sanctify our mind, our will, our intellect, our emotions. We need to bring it into conformity with the Spirit of God and our spirit, which has now been given life through the Holy Spirit. And when we are raptured, then our bodies will be also completely redeemed. The God of peace is the one who does this, sanctifying us holy spirit soul and body the process has begun for some of us for some of you maybe the process has not begun maybe you have not surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ my advice to you do it do it do it you know you know we just love encouraging one another to do bad things why not tease each other to do good things isn't that what church is supposed to be about let us Encourage one another towards love and good deeds. That's the whole purpose of church. It's not so that you can dress up in your Sunday best and impress everyone the way, the way you look. Or it's not to, for you to fulfill some, some ritual. You know, I, I, you know, up, down, back, down, raise my hands, dance around. You know, whatever the ritual is, there's all kinds of rituals. But that's not the purpose of church. That may involve some of that. I think it's awesome when people raise their hands and surrender to God and worship Him in spirit and truth. I think it's awesome when people kneel down in reverence and quietness before God and worship Him quietly. Whatever the Holy Spirit has you do. I've seen people dance in the presence of the Lord. As long as they're worshiping Jesus, it's, you know, that's the important thing. But Jesus, is the, this is how we run this race, by looking to the author and finisher of our faith. Why? Because who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. See, it always comes back to the cross, doesn't it? Everything comes back to the cross. Even our redemption through the rapture is connected to the cross. Because Paul says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. It's all, it revolves around the cross. The cross is the power of salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and to the Greek second. But to those who don't believe, it is a rock of offense or a stone of stumbling. Foolishness. And so we're called to run the race with endurance. Secondly, our discipline is in the faith. Verse 3, it says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. God doesn't want us to become discouraged. That's why at night we need to remember his faithfulness, like the psalmist encouraged us. Okay? You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. I don't think any of us here have been threatened, our lives have been threatened yet, for serving Jesus. Okay? And you know what? I'm going to put this in the historical context. This was written to Hebrew Christians in the first century. Their lives were not yet threatened by death either. The siege of Jerusalem had not happened yet. It's still a few years away. And the author is reminding them that you guys, you know, you haven't been threatened with martyrdom yet. Like Stephen, who was stoned by the Sanhedrin. And others. 
And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he, re he receives. If you endure chastening, God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten or discipline? I discipline my son. I love my son. We are good friends. We are fellow football fanatics. We are fellow preachers of the gospel now. He's training to do that. We are, we, we, there, my son and I are a lot alike in many ways. And then there are some ways where he's very different. But let me tell you something. As much as I love my son, when I see that he is doing wrong, I rebuke him. Why? Because I love him. And God does the same thing with us. When we are doing wrong, God rebukes us. Amen. And how does he rebuke us? The Holy Spirit inside of us convicts us. When, when, when we're constantly feeling afraid of God, like, like, we're, like we're feeling like, you know, I, I believe that's the Holy Spirit trying to tell us something. And that's why we need to search ourselves daily with a sober faith. Am I doing what God has called me to do? Sometimes you can do good things and do them in disobedience because that's not what God wants you to do. I'll take myself as an example. I could go out and try to train for another profession, be it, you know, uh, a doctor if I was young enough, okay? And that would be a good thing. Doctors are good people. They do a good service. But it would be disobedience because God has called me to preach. And you're saying, well, how do I know what God wants me to do? Listen to the Holy Spirit. Amen. He'll tell you. How do we learn to hear the Spirit's voice? By studying God's Word. By spending time in prayer. By spending time in worship. When I was a young preacher at Pioneer Valley Assembly of God, I learned how to hear God's voice when I worship. There would be times when I'd be worshiping God and the Holy Spirit would tell me, say this in your sermon. And I would. And it would be the best part of the sermon. God speaks to me through many ways. One time he spoke to me through a movie. And showed me how sinful I was being. He let, it, he, he let me see this movie. You know, and, 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 the, and by the end of the movie I was bawling. Because the Holy Spirit was disciplining me. And I'm so grateful that he did. Amen. See, because I don't go out and discipline other people's children, do I? If I did, I might get into trouble. Okay? I discipline my children. God disciplines his children as well. And we need to be willing to accept that discipline. Because it demonstrates to us that we're really sons. If we're not disciplined, then it says that we're illegitimate. We're not, we, we aren't partakers of the faith. And so... It kind of gives a little bit of a better taste to that concept that we learn obedience through suffering, doesn't it? Jesus was the Son of God. He learned obedience through suffering. We learn obedience through suffering. When we disobey God, we suffer, right? Think of King David. King David was a man after God's own heart. And King David one time got it in his head, I'm going to number the, the, the armies of Israel, which he was commanded specifically not to do. And he did it anyways. And he had to suffer the consequences. Now, God did forgive him. God did restore him. And God can do the same thing for you. If you're in disobedience to God right now, all you have to do is repent. 1 John 1, 9 still applies. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life, you can ask him to forgive you of your sins right now. Ask him into your life and he'll do the same for you. Because God loves the world, everyone in it. And he wants to save everyone in it. No matter whether you're a man or a woman, an adult or a child, no matter what race you are, no matter what economic, social status you have, 
Whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. God wants to save you. He wants to save you. And our discipline in the faith comes through the Holy Spirit rebuking us when we do wrong. And that discipline is our training. Go with me to verse 9. It says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? You know what? You know what saddens me about America? Is that the dads of America are made out to be bumbling idiots. Never right. Can't balance a checkbook. They don't know how to raise children. They're an inconvenience. They always pick the wrong, the wrong thing to do. And their wives have to rescue them all the time. Or their children have to rescue the parents. And I don't believe that's of God. Now, I'm not saying that fathers are perfect and don't make mistakes. We do. I'm a father. I've made mistakes. Okay? But I don't consider myself a bumbling idiot that's always wrong. Maybe some of you think I'm a bumbling idiot, but I don't. And I know God doesn't. Because God says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And he's called me to be the dad that I am. Okay? And I'll let the fruit of my family show whether I am a good dad or not. Of course, it is dependent upon obedience from my son as well. It's not just the parents. But let me tell you something. I believe that the devil wants men to look dumb and stupid and foolish because God our Father is represented in male form. And the devil wants you to think that God is a bumbling idiot and he never gets it right and he doesn't care about you and that's not true. He's the father of light. He's the father of life. And he knows exactly what you need when you need it. In fact, Jesus said, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. See, the devil doesn't want you thinking that. The devil wants you thinking that, oh, God's not fair to me. You know, he's made mistakes with me. He lets, you know, he blesses everyone else but me. Not true. Not true. You're still alive, aren't you? He's the author of life. Even if you haven't accepted him right now, he's still giving you a gift. The gift of life. The gift of choice. The gift of opportunity to seek him. Early we heard in a testimony where it says we're not to worry about the things of this world, but we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then it comes a promise with it. And all these things shall be added unto you. Maybe not in this age, but in the age to come, most definitely. But I also do believe it happens in this age too. God has blessed me with good things in this, in this life. Good grief, I'm an American. That's a blessing in and of itself. And don't let people tell you that this is a horrible country. This is not a horrible country. Is it a perfect country? No. It's not a perfect country. But it's not a horrible country. And I've done some world travel. And let me tell you, this is about the best place on the planet. Amen. <laughs> Never have so many have had so much for so long. Yeah, there might be countries where the income per capita is higher and you have people that are you know, wealthy beyond belief. But... Not everyone in their country shares that wealth. But this country is very prosperous. Our poor have widescreen TVs, cell phones, drive around probably two or three cars, eat and don't work, have money handed to them, hand over fist, okay? People who know how to play the system, you know? I know of several circumstances sometimes where, where people will cheat the government. They'll, they'll lie to the government so they can get more government assistance. We've heard it in the news. We've, you know, it, this, there's a lot that this country has. But you know what the most precious thing this country has? Founding fathers that were very godly in many ways. Not perfect, but very godly. 
Amen. who set up a system of government with checks and balances that we have been systematically destroying. Every, every generation, we get farther and farther away. Our training is to bring us to respect of God. But not only that, it gives us life. Because he's the father of spirits and he gives us, it says in verse 10, for indeed, for a few days, chastening us as seemed best to them, but he is not, but it's, he, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers in his holiness. What, what the writer of, of Hebrews is saying, our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time as seemed, what seemed best to them. Okay. But our heavenly father disciplines us perfectly for our profit. I'm a capitalist. I like the word profit. I don't believe in crony capitalism, but I do believe in legitimate, a man is worthy of his wages, or if, you're, uh, uh, if you have your own business and you, you step out and you take risks and you present a product that, that people want, I, think, I feel you have the right to enjoy the fruits of your, of your labors so that you can prosper others. In particular, your family. You know how many kids don't have fathers providing for them? And I'm not just talking financially, I'm talking about emotionally and spiritually. Those are the kids that are more likely to get in trouble. Statistics have shown that. People who come from families who own homes and have two parents tend to have less issues than people who only come from single parent families living in projects. It's just, it's just that simple. But yet we keep pouring dollar after dollar into a broken concept. You know, we think, oh, give people a fish, we feed them. We need to teach them how to fish so they can feed themselves. And that's biblical. The Bible says if a man does not work, he shall not eat. Amen. You know? We're supposed to work. Guys, that's our, our job. Now, if you're unemployed, I mean, there are circumstances. I get that. And, if you, and I don't have a problem with people legitimately going on, on the system to get them through a rough patch. But I think that they should always have the goal of getting off the system. I don't think you need 99 weeks to do it. Okay? I mean, it, how, that's over a year. And now you don't even have to prove that you're looking for work. You can just keep collecting food stamps and do whatever, you know. It's not right. It's not right. You got to try at least. Anyway, we are to submit to God. God our Father trains us so that we can share in His holiness. Because that's, that's His goal. For indeed, he, he does this that we may profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. That's the ultimate in prosperity. Partaking in, in God's holiness. When I pray for my son and his future wife, I pray that God profits them. But I pray that, that they will have spiritual blessings above all else. Because that's the real treasures. And then finally, let's, let's, let's bring this home. It says, verse 11, No chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by that. Isn't that what we want in life? Peace? Hallelujah. Hope? Joy? <laughs> Love? Righteousness? Don't we want to be right with God? Amen. Let me tell you something. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very blessed, and I praise God for a godly family, for a mom and a dad who love Jesus, who took me to church even when I didn't want to go to church, who, who, who brought me to Sunday school, and, and, and who encouraged me to, to accept Christ into my heart, and encouraged me to live for God no matter what, T teaching me cool things like, you know, and, 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 and I praise God for that. And I'll never forget the one time that I got drunk in my life. I was 13 years old. And I was at a wedding. And my cousins, who were not Christians, were giving me 
screwdrivers because they knew I liked orange juice. Okay? Surprised that a pastor knows what a, what a screwdriver is, right? Besides the tool, the drink of vodka and orange juice. And I got a little drunk. And after it happened, I felt bad. In fact, I felt so bad that I went to my parents and I confessed to them that I had gotten drunk. Why? Because I love and respect my parents, my mom and my dad. I love them. Amen. I respect them. And that love and respect drove me to confess to them. And our love and respect for our Heavenly Father will drive us to repent as well. And I'll never forget, they didn't punish me. They did, but they didn't. You know what my punishment was? The look of disappointment on their face. Killed me. To see my mom and my dad disappointed in me. That's all they had to do. I never got drunk ever again. I have never been drunk since. And it's because of God first being raised up. So what, is, what, is, what does this, this running this race and being disciplined and trained, what, 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 what does it bring? The righteousness of God? How do we practically get there? I believe verses 12 and 13 give us the answer. It says, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that which is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. We are to strengthen our hands. In the King James, it says we are to lift up our hands. What are we doing when we're lifting up our hands to God? We're surrendering, saying, I give up to you, God. That's what people are doing when they're lifting hands in worship. We need to lift our hands up to God and say, God, Jesus, you're the author and finisher of my faith. Strengthen me. Strengthen my feeble knees. Because they're wobbly. I'm trying to run this race and I keep falling on my face. Strengthen my weeble. My, my weeble. <laughs> Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. <laughs> my feeble knees. Strengthen them. Strengthen my hands. Because it's a, it's a mountain climb, too. We've got to be able to pull ourselves to, the, you know, to what God has called us to do. And he promises us that he will be with us every step of the way. And the best way to do it is to make straight your paths. Stop trying to take the crooked way around. Don't look for shortcuts. Take the straight path. And that's why I think the straight path is Jesus, because he said he is the way. Take the straight way of Jesus and let him strengthen you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my friends here. I, I know that we... We spent some time in your word, but I ask that it would not be unfruitful. I pray that you would discipline us. I pray that we would operate as your sons and daughters, that we would realize that this present suffering is nothing compared to our future glory. I pray that we would make straight our ways, that we would walk with Jesus, and that he would lead us and guide us. And I'd like to take a moment to address the, uh, the congregation, people out in YouTube land, let me ask you this question. Is Jesus your Lord? Is he your Savior? If he's not, do you want to make him your Lord, your Savior? He loves you. He wants to give you eternal life. But you have a problem. You're sinful. And he cannot let you into his holy habitation. Because he hates sin, but he loves you. And so he's made a way to eliminate your sin and bring you into fellowship with him. And the way is Jesus. you got to ask Jesus to come into your heart and make you a new creature. One who is perfected in the image of our Father God, who is perfect. If there's anyone here or out in YouTube land that you would like to do that, it's easy. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart 
And what I mean by believe is not just intellectual belief, but faith. You know that you know that you know. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, we shall be saved. And if there's anyone here that doesn't know you personally and you would like to know him personally, if you would just slip your hand up real quick, I promise I won't embarrass you. I just want to pray with you. Anyone? Yes, I see that hand. Praise God. Yes. All right, I'm going to ask the congregation and those out in YouTube land to pray with me. Pray this prayer. Now, it's not a magical prayer. You've got to believe what it says in order for it to work, but it's simple. It goes like this. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Make me a new creature. Save me. I surrender to you. Be my Lord, my leader, my comforter, my discipliner. I accept you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, whether it's in YouTube land or here in this church, happy birthday! You have just been born of God's Spirit, if you really believe that. And you know what, folks? That's my purpose, is to see people born again of God's Spirit. And if you're a, someone who already did that once and you did it again, maybe this was the real deal. I don't know. Personally, I would pray that prayer as many times as it took for the assurance that I was really saved, because you don't want to gamble your eternal destiny. You don't want to do it. Because hell is forever. But guess what? So is heaven. Amen. And so I praise God for that.